Hello, let me introduce myself. My name's Keith and I created Chibi Akamas. Uh, I created everything you see today, from the characters and the graphics to the music and of course the game itself. Now the game was written in assembly language with um, the WinApe emulator and the music was created with Arcos Tracker. Now firstly I'd like to apologise for the fact this video won't be as good as the usual YouTube videos you'll see. I don't create these things normally, I don't really have any experience of it, and I haven't got a proper microphone, so we're having to make the best we can with it. So anyway, um, this video was recorded in WinApe, I recorded it some time ago, and now I'm narrating it today. Well anyway, a bit about me, I was born in England and I moved to Japan a few years ago. My job is computers, but I don't do anything with computer games in my uh, profession, so I do, do it as a hobby instead. I started learning Japanese many years ago. Uh, my employer in England actually had a Japanese branch, and they were willing to move me to Japan to continue my interest in Japanese language. So that's how I got into the country. Now, anyway, today we'll be looking at the game mostly from a technical point of view. Uh, part of the reason for that is um, the user CPC Forever on the CPC Wiki website is producing his own magazine. I've um, helped out with a, an article about the game in more detail on there. So I'd encourage you, if you want to know more about how the characters came about and why the design choices were made, please, please um, support that magazine. Please follow that magazine to find out some more of those kind of sites. But today we'll be looking at the actual technicalities of why why the game works like it did, what challenges we've seen, etc, etc. So anyway, you'll, you'll see on the screen now we are looking at the introduction first. Now, the first rather tough thing about the introduction was um, because the game had to work on 64K systems, I had to limit myself to 64 kilobytes. Um, this meant I couldn't use the screen buffers as well as in the usual gameplay um, because I needed them for the big full-size graphics. And that meant um, during the start with the decap decapitation scene, you will have noticed there was some glitching, some flickering. That's because the screen buffer's gone. There's nothing I could do about it and make the game look like it does here unless I wrote the entire introduction twice, once for 64K and once for 128K, which would have been a lot of extra work. So unfortunately, it wasn't really an option. Now, the style of this introduction is, is slightly um, comical. It's supposed to be a little bit um, fantasy kind of uh, a ch children's book narration, and the reason for that was to kind of downplay the, um, the violence in the scenes. Now, uh, the, the whole point of the introduction was um, Chibiko is the only vampire in the game world. Uh, the reason she is the only one is because she is so bad that she has had sort of this divine punishment put on her and it was trying to balance the well she's got to be really bad to make this plot work versus well I don't want the game to be just so offensive no one will play it so that that was part of the reason for the style of the introduction so anyway we've got all of these screens here and hopefully there's a few jokes that uh, maybe will make people laugh, laugh a little bit maybe they won't I don't know um, now the graphics here are written with a uh, produced sorry with a program called a sprite compiler um, it's a program I wrote myself, there's loads of others and I'm sure loads of them are better than mine. I tried to code everything myself with the exception of the Arcos music player and so I wrote my own sprite compiler and what a sprite compiler does is you give it a bitmap or PNG or whatever and it converts it to raw machine code. So rather than having data and a program to show that data, all you have is program, which means it's extremely fast, but unfortunately it is not small. It actually in most cases makes the data bigger. So um, <laughs> that does cause some problems, but it has a very important use, which we get to later. So anyway, that's the introduction gone through, um, and now we'll start the game. And it's just loading now. So here we've got a bit of ex explanation. Um, these loading screens were actually really just explaining the plot and making the levels actually tie together in some kind of coherent way. I'm not sure it entirely worked, but that's what we've got. So here's the first level. Now, um, you, you can probably see what we've got here is a, a gradient background, some sprites on the screen, um, some blue at the top, some red at the bottom, and some purple in the middle. Now, you should bear in mind that all of this is done on a four color screen. And you're probably thinking, I can see far more than four colors. And it's a trick. You see, the way it works is you switch all four colors while the screen is being redrawn every single frame. Um, I call it raster screen palette switching. I'm sure there's loads of it, so I don't know what the proper term is. But 
but anyway, as the raster line is the um, is the old CRT pixel being drawn, and you change the colours while those pixels are being drawn, and that allows you to trick the screen into having more than four colours when it shouldn't have. Um, and I'm not not going to lie to you, the reason I chose a sideways scrolling game is because I wanted to play with this raster trick. Um, the other thing is the reason I chose a bullet hell game is the Amstrad CPC, the conventional Amstrad CPC, has no sprites. So I wanted a game that avoided using sprites. Well, let's have lots and lots of dots for a few sprites, let's have it scroll horizontally, and let's see how many colours we can get on screen for a bit of a laugh. And I do quite enjoy playing with how many colours I can get on screen. Now, th the game does actually use the CPC+, Plus, which allows for 16 sprites that use 16 colours each. The, the version you're viewing here is the CPC Plus version, which is why the Chibiko character, the, the vampire, is, looks a lot better than everything else, and why the, um, the hearts in the corner and the scrolls at the bottom have obviously more colours than everything else on screen. But I think the overall um, appearance is very, is very good for a, a Mode 1 game, and I think the game overall looks better in Mode 1 than it would have in Mode 0, because in Mode 0, of course, it would have halved the resolution of all the um, enemy sprites, which I think wouldn't have been a good trade-off, and I think keeping the Mode 1 graphics gives the game a unique look, and even with the colour limitations, those limitations force different arti artistic choices, which I think are worth looking at. But anyway, there we go. Um, I think we're nearly, are we nearly at the end of level 1? Maybe not. But anyway, um, I mean, you can see there's sort of all kinds of sprites scrolling around the screen. Um, the, the, the sprite movement on level 1 is very simple. I at the end. The, 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 each sprite only has a very simple linear movement, with some exceptions. A lot of this is memory limited, and we'll go into that. So here we go, we've got the first boss battle here. Now, um, <coughs> as I say, um, there's a lot of limitations in the game. The, the, the sprite engine of the episode of episode 1, what we're watching now, can only clip 24 pixel sprites. And what I mean by that is um, when a sprite comes on and off screen, um, it can only, it, it has to be clipped so that you only show the bit that should be on screen and it can only do that with 24 pixel sprites. So th this um, Skolga boss, as it's called, is made up of 24 pixel wide strips. Now the height is actually different, but the height doesn't matter because it only scrolls in from the side. It never goes off the top or the bottom of the screen, so only the height is a problem. So that, that's how that works. It, 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 a lot of the game is about writing a good game engine that's reliable and works, and then bending the rules of your own code to make it as impressive as it can be when really the game engine can't do what you want. Rather unfortunate example in level two here, the background was supposed to be a sort of forest scene, a bit like the sort of Wonder Boy game. Uh, it was supposed to be some sort of tree trunks in the middle and some um, some leaves in the top and things, but the, the game engine for episode one can only do gradients, that's all it can do. And not only that, it can only do very specific gradients that are quite com that have quite complex limitations, and that is simply speed. If the entire background was bitmaps, the speed, the processing power would all be used up, and the bullet health would just be it would just be impossible. I did try, I did try with episode two to do a much more complex tiled background, and even doing a tiny percentage of the screen, the frame rate just fell apart. And I spent ages trying to optimize it. I just couldn't make it work. So the the reason the backgrounds in the in the game are very simple, and in some cases like this, not really up to the job, is because the gameplay is all about dodging bullets. It's all about you know, the, the actual action. The backgrounds are sacrificed. But now the new game does have a sort of the, the episode two that's coming up soon does have an improvement on this. Episode two can do um, repeating tiles. Those tiles are 32 pixels wide because of a weird quirk of the um, Z80 processor, I can do 32 pixels fairly fast. So it parts of the screen are gradients and parts of them are these 32 pixel wide repeating tiles. The frame rate drop is virtually zero and it looks a lot better. So things have got better, but as I say, there, there is this limitation in place. Now, and, and an, an important thing to note is about level two. I said earlier that enemies can only move in very limited patterns for memory reasons. Now you'll see there's a rabbit just come on screen and it jumps, it moves across, jumps up and down, and then carries on. Now this was a bit of a trick, as I said about it before, about tricking your own code. This was a trick. I actually attached a huge chunk of machine code onto the top of that character so that its movement bent the rules of the game engine. Uh, and this is something else that's a big improvement in the Episode 2 game that's coming out soon. 
I don't need to do that anymore. I, there's a new animator scripting engine built into the game, so I can do very complex patterns of animation with no machine code. No machine code means no debugging, no problems there. So I can create a lot of complex enemies without having to debug them all. So that's quite important. So here we go, we're now on to um, the, the next boss. Now, um, this character is of course is called Zombie Chew, which is a spoof of something we won't mention for copyright reasons. So, and there's a joke about copyright. So, um, a lot of, no one really got it, but the character, the shoes falling from the sky and the things moving across the bottom are from a South Park episode, which also parodied the same show, the, the same TV series. So, um, it, I don't think anyone really got the joke, but that's what it is. Now, uh, the game does have quite a few Japanese references in it. Um, the fact that Zombie Chew blows kisses at the player is a pun about the word Chew. Chew is a, a, an onomatopoeia, that's a sound effect. It's the sound effect of a mouse squeak, but it's also the sound effect of a kiss, so that's why that happens. Um, the, the kiss effect in this is also uh, a new feature for this level um, because it heat seeps onto the player. Now, that, that kind of effect later got used for the, um, the coins as well, but this was where I first coded it into the game engine, and it does become more relevant in the game as well. Um, so yeah, uh, also the Zombie 2 character has a more complex move pattern. It moves up and down and yo-yos around the screen. So it, it, it's again, it's like the rabbit movement, but, but more so. It, it's a program code running on top of the main engine that controls the position of the character, controls where the bullets come from. And uh, another weird trick of the game is um, the, size of the, sp the, the size of the sprite may look very, very big. And in fact, this one is made of three 24 pixel wide, probably 72 pixel tall sprites or something like that. But the hit area is actually an invisible object, and that's only always ever 24 pixels wide. So again, another quirk of the game engine that when you're designing these things, unfortunately, a lot of the time, it's just a case of get it working, get it working reliably. Oh dear, it's got these limitations. How can I make it do what I want while, while respecting those limitations? Because writing a totally different game engine for every level would just be ridiculous. You'd, you'd end up with a game that you could never debug. So, as I say, that's it, it's often that's how it works. And I think the game overall did manage to achieve a lot with strange limitations like 24 pixel hit zones and whatever, 24 pixel strikes, whatever. So here we're on to level three. This is this is the sort of water level, which is really where the um, the horror theme kind of fell apart. But um, I, I did. I did like the idea of a water level, and um, th this level does play with the raster colour effect quite a lot, and it took me about an entire day to get it working. Um, you'll see soon that the water kind of raises and fills the entire screen, and the way it does it is uh, multiple raster colour changes, multiple changes to the configuration of the raster colours. So um, I say I, I did enjoy seeing that in the coding it, but oh, it didn't take a long time. Now, I'll just explain something about the um, the way the game um, the mechanics work with regard to power-ups. Now, I, I'm, I'll be, I won't lie to you, I'm not actually a big um, shoot -em up player. I find them frustrating. Um, and one of the main things that annoy me about them is games like R-Type. You get hit, you lose all your power-ups. So if you're doing badly, you start doing worse, and you might have been able to play the game. Never made a lot of sense to me. So... Um, Chibi Akamas is more based on the Xenon 2 idea, where in Xenon 2 if you've got a power-up you never lost it, but that would have been difficult because I've got so few power-ups in my game, uh, I couldn't really make that work. So it, it does a trade-off where you gain the power-ups throughout the level, you keep them until the boss is defeated, and then the next level it all starts again. So I felt that gave you the good balance between, well you can die as many times as you want, and boy will you, um, but you, you should be able to have fun, you don't get unfairly penalised for dying. And another thing that I found quite confusing about people's comments on the game, they say oh, the game's too hard. Um, well, I, I understand you, you, you will never play this game and not lose a life, you can just forget that. But the game gives you up to 255 continues. No one with any, no matter how minimum your level of ability at, at shoot em ups, you will complete this game on your first go if you set the minimum, the starting continues high enough. P people seem to um, seem to want to sort of associate continue using continues with failure. The, the game was really trying to go towards more. Well, if you keep persevering at it, you're going to win no matter what. If you want to 
you know, challenge yourself and see how, how few continues you can use to win the game, well, please do that. But I wanted everyone to see the game all the way through, to play the game and hopefully enjoy it. Uh, interesting glitch on screen at the moment. You'll notice a fish flying in the air and there's another fish waiting at the bottom. I only noticed that today. I don't know what went wrong there. I think it's something to do with the machine code. As I said, the, the, those kind of weird moving enemies have machine code attached to them to make them work and it looks like there's a major bug in that one. It's just dropped off the top of the screen. screen. Makes absolutely no sense, but too late to fix it now. So, so here we're going to the, uh, the, the boss. Um, I'll just explain. I don't think really people understood what this boss was because, um, again, limitations in the code. It's supposed to be a giant anglerfish. Uh, uh, an anglerfish, of course, has a light attaching from an antenna. Uh, in this base, the antenna, it was supposed to be a saw blade. Unit. That's why it's called angler grinder. Um, you never saw the entire boss on screen, and this was intentional, really. Um, some of the old NES and Game Boy games, they used to do a trick. NES and Game Boy had a limited number of spikes, but they also had a tile array which was used for backgrounds. And they would use the tile array to fake a very, very big boss. And often you'd only see bits of it on screen for a potential limitation. I wanted to try and do that, but of course, big catch with my game has no tile arrays, so I actually had to use sprites like tile arrays to fake this effect. But I, I, again, it was kind of, I wanted to do it as a bit of a. I wanted to try and mimic the things that well known games did just sort of out of my own amusement. And so that's what this boss is about. So, uh, uh, another interesting thing, of course, is during this phase of the attack, you can't kill it. It's only the key that can be harmed. So, a lot of the time in this boss battle, you're dodging, you're staying safe rather than being able to attack all the time, which I think gave the boss some validity. It is rather tragically a lot easier to kill than the zombie tube once you know what you're doing. But I, I still quite like this boss battle just because it had something unique about it, uh, both technically and both gameplay-wise. But as I say, uh, all round of it, again, why, why is there a giant robot fish in a gothic game? Let's not ask those questions. Let's just try and enjoy it for what it is. So anyway, we're, um, we're moving to the, um, the fourth level, which is the cave level. So again, this level is a bit of a um, a bit of a homage to um, Mega Man specifically. Yeah, the, well, that's the one I remember. Um, Mega Man had a level where um, there was a boss that if you, that if the boss was alive, well, not a boss, so it was a mini boss or a sub boss or something. If the boss was alive, the screen would be illuminated. But as soon as you killed it, the game would go dark. And that was a bit of what I was trying to do here. Um, I was in in this case, the colour of the screen was it was being defined by what was on the screen so that flame monster just came on and the screen glows red if you kill it it goes black and now later on you've got phosphorus rocks and um, fireflies and jellyfish and basically anything i could think of that would produce light it was a bit desperate trying to think of enemies that would make make the level work so i, I apologize if they didn't make any sense um, another quirk of working around the game engine that giant ghost that you've got here at the moment that's actually four enemies together and when you kill them it runs a special piece of code and destroys all four now although the game engine could have done that as two strips or as one giant enemy the hit zone would have been 24 pixels and it would have been totally baffling if the only place you could kill the ghost was in the top left corner which would have been what i would have happened if i had you if i hadn't coded it the way it did now again this is a limitation of the episode one game engine the episode two game engine does not have that limitation the, the the enemies can be any size and the hit zone matches the size they are defined as so again that's a that's another thing that i realized was a limitation of the first game and i improved on for the second one the, the, the second game was very much a sort of continuation of the first game the, the, the game was supposed to have two playable characters that's why it was called chibi Atomus. i actually do, came up with the idea for the second character about two weeks after the first one it, they, it's really always supposed to be in there but this was my first game i coded in assembly language i really Really wasn't confident I could finish it at all. I didn't. I, it was kind of this was my crazy project that you know I'll, I'll try and do this, but it will never come to anything. But I'll try anyway. It was really like that. So the, the, the thought that I was going to finish this game was ridiculous. The thought that I would finish it with two player support was just you know, beyond the wildest dreams. So I I pulled back that 
I pulled back that capability. I, I did code some of the game engine with the intention of, well, this will work better when it's two-player, but I never actually coded the two-player support into this game engine. It was added for the new game. So um, that, that's just something to sort of bear in mind when you when you do see this and when you wonder well, why why is it called Chibi Akamas? Why is it not called Chibi Akama? Ch Chibi Akamas. Um, Chibi means um, miniature. Akama means demon, by the way, just, or, or monster, just in case you're interested. So that that's kind of the that's kind of what the game means, and that's why the the S was put in brackets because it's like well yeah it should be slower, but it can't be because there's only one main character. Um, another thing that has been fixed for the sequel that was a limitation because of time and my capabilities when I worked this first game. Um, with both games, though, I do have to say I have absolutely put what I could, what I am actually capable of in this programming language to the limit. Um, there's no greater example of, than that of the than that in this game than the last level. Um, I will explain that later. But as I say. <laughs> It's quite a surprising way that that last level came, the last boss came about. So anyway, um, we're progressing through here. Um, these um, spikes are actually the first enemy, the, sorry, not an enemy, they're the first object in the game that actually hurts the player. Um, every object, every moving object in the game was basically the same thing. They all had a movement direction. They had a program which could be an attack pattern, and they had a life. Now, if they had a life of zero, that would mean they didn't hurt you. If they had a, a life of attacking, you, you could shoot them. And if they had a life of time, they would age naturally and die off of their own accord. But if that life was so long that they never left the screen, that they left the screen before they died, that would basically mean they were they appeared immortal and they would hurt you if you touched them, which is what those ones did. So here we go. We're now onto the um, the sort of this was kind of I was kind of keeping this level secret because um, the, the the levels I showed before the game was released always scrolled um, to the right, uh, but because the, the game doesn't really scroll now, I know that sounds weird, but what happens is each object that comes on the screen has a direction that it's told it's going to move, um, and that direction can be one of any di it can be up, down, left, right, diagonals, and it can be different speeds to, to approximate diagonals in the same way as the bullets. It's actually almost the exact same code that does the bullet movement as the um, sprite movement. So um, the game can scroll in any direction. It doesn't care. It doesn't know the difference even. Um, the, the only thing is the background, the background scrolling code could only scroll left or right. Uh, and because of um, the technical limitations with regards to speed, I couldn't make a vertical scroll for this, which is why the grab background is static. Of course, the multicolor trick can only work horizontally because the, um, the raster draws from left to right down the screen. So I couldn't I couldn't really make any use of the changing colours. It's not possible to change the left third of the screen to one colour and the right colour third of the screen to another colour like you can change the top and the bottom. It just wasn't possible, which is why this screen has less colours than everything else, unfortunately. But um, I should point out, um, this, this level was kind of a bit of a, a bit based on Xenon 2. Um, it was one of my sort of favourite shoots much when I was a kid. Um, the the um, flaming enemies on the side. Um, those flying things, um, maybe not so much, but um, as I say, it was trying to be inspired by that game. And the, the, there's the um, monster with a sort of double mouth on the side, which you'll see quite often in this level. And that was um, very much <laughs> based on the. Um, there's, there's, a, there's an enemy on the first level which kind of opens up, and there's, an uh, there's a second mouth inside it. And that was a direct sort of a parody of that. I had at one point thought about literally copying the sprites from Xenon 2, but I, I felt that people would accuse it of being a rip-off rather than a homage, so I decided that wasn't the best thing to do. So, uh, unfortunately, now, it's probably so different that no one would have even guessed it was inspired by Xenon 2 at all, but that, that's where it did come from. So, anyway, we're, um, we're going to be reaching the last level soon then. Um, I'll just uh, explain what I was saying earlier about um, the technical limitations. Now, th the game, the main game only has 255 bullets on screen at once, and that is because everything has to be done within a single byte. Um, not, not just from the point of view of how much memory you've got, but loot counters, everything. A a an 8-bit machine is very fast as 8-bits, very slow 16-bit, which 
throws this 0 to 255 or 1 to 256 limit on you and if you respect that it'll be fast if you try and work around it it's probably going to be very slow now so i only had 255 bullets on screen when you when the enemies are on the screen um, but with the last boss i wanted to try and do something really really crazy and i came up with this idea well let's try and get 1024 bullets on screen can i do it i don't know uh, uh, how are you going to pull that off I'll figure it out. It was really the sort of reverse of what I've been doing earlier. I decided what I was going to do, and I just worked until it worked. And it, it took about a week to get the the, um, the Omega Array bullet effect to work at a viable speed. And the way I did it, and the way you always do it with these kind of games, is um, you're always trading off. If you've got spare, spare memory, you can make things faster. If you don't have memory, let any memory left, you have to use speed. So um, the, the the, the Omega Array effect, it's actually four 256, 256 bullet loops, which is the way you keep within that 256 limit again. Um, but it uses much more memory than the regular bullets arrays, and also it moves at single pixel precision rather than the faster precision. Um, by doing that, I can use simpler mathematical commands to, to get the effect. So a different set of limitations, more memory, um, slower movement, that gave me the ability to have this huge 1,000 bullet limit. And to be honest, I would have liked it to have been even bigger, but couldn't do it. I would have also liked the bullets to have been bigger. Um, they're just a four pixel dot. The reason for that is they are not a sprite. Um, they are actually, the program code is directly manipulating the screen memory. Um, loading a sprite, even looking at a sprite pointer would have been too slow for 2, 255 times on screen. So what you do is you work out where the screen position is and you just change the byte in the screen position straight away. That's fast. You have to do it. You, anything you do with the bullet code, you have to do 255 times for the regular levels for this last boss, a thousand times. And so a single fraction of the CPU time wasted is just going to slow you down beyond belief. So you, anything you can do to make it faster, anything you can do to make it simple, you just have to do it because this is going to be the major slowdown of the game. So anyway, here we've got our boss battle, which is a character called the Necromancer. Um, now, um, I, d I don't know if... Um, I should have explained it when the, the previous bit was on, was on before, but um, there's, there's this kind of um, joke with the Necromancer that she becomes come to confront the Necromancer about why the enemies are attacking her. Uh, the Necromancer doesn't actually know what she's talking about. Um, the Necromancer sees her, knows, knows who she is because she's lighting the village, and says, oh, you've come for me at last, well, I'm going to teach you a lesson. And we'll explain why. So um, the Necromancer battle was probably a little bit easier. I mean, I think it worked fairly well, but uh, the Zombie 2 battle is probably the more tough battle, which is uh, unfortunate. The, the, the other thing with coding this game, I wrote each level one after the other, so I wrote level one first, level four final battle last, and I was constantly changing the game engine code, and a, a slight change to the hit zone of the main character would make massive difficult changes to the difficulty of the previous levels, and you, you could just end up reprogramming the game infinitely, you know, oh, I've changed the game code again, now the first level's too easy, I'll have to change it, oh, now the four, fourth level's too hard, I'll have to change it. You, you, you just end up having to go, well, it's good enough, I'll release it. And as I say, unfortunately, um, the Zombie 2 battle is massively difficult. The, um, the level 3 and 4 battles are probably too easy. But anyway, and you'll also notice this is the first time you've got the um, power bar at the bottom. It's in all of the boss battles of the new game. Uh, the simple reason again is I hadn't coded it in I hadn't coded it when I wrote the third boss or the second boss. I only coded it when I wrote the fourth boss. And the way the, the, the life bar, the, the way the remaining life of the other bosses worked wasn't comparable with the life bar, so it didn't really make sense to try and port it back, and it would have taken a lot of time to port it back, so I just had it as an exclusive for the last boss. Um, it kind of works, because the last boss is the only one that doesn't visually show the damage they've incurred. The damage is incurred. The other ones will all change some way when they're running out of life. And now we've got another thing that was only written at the last moment, which is what I'm now calling the coffee time effect, which is a parody of the tea time effect from um, from the cotton games. And where that's where there's a sort of huge burst of coins when you defeat the boss, which... Um, I did quite enjoy, and I, I liked seeing when it when it was in there. But again, it was, I didn't think of it until the last le last level, so it's not in there. But um, anyway, so here we go. Um, this is our end sequence. Um, 
it's quite slow so I'm not going to narrate it or explain it all um, as it appears on screen but basically the story is that Chib Chibiko has come to confront the necromancer who she thinks has caused all her problems uh, the necromancer hasn't done anything Chibiko has caused all the problems herself because of her own misbe misbehaviour um, so the, the game is quite dark uh, there's a lot of violence in it a lot of twisted stuff in it but it is supposed to be a moral message it's, it's a reverse moral message in the sense that Chibigo is absolutely terrible she doesn't learn her lessons she is a horrible horrible person but she doesn't gain anything from it at all so as you say she she the, the as it says on the screen here the monsters that were invading her castle were the ones that she had mutated by poisoning the rivers and driven out by burning down the forest so, you know, you, you reap what you sow is the, is the lesson there. So anyway, um, I think we're pretty much at the end of the game. Let's see if I had anything else I wanted to talk about. Okay, but well, I think um, I mean, it's pretty much it. So I'd just like to say again, please check out um, CPC Forever's magazine that's coming out soon. I will link that in the comments. Um, he's put an awful lot of work into it, and um, so please support him. And also, of course, just please support anyone else who's developing games, anyone else who's making retro game YouTube videos you like. It, it, everyone in the retro gaming community pretty much is doing it purely for fun or for the, the feeling of providing you know content that others will enjoy um this game tb akuma's episode one took me six months to develop it was for my first assembly game and you might think that's pretty fast but when i say six months i mean i worked on it every day for hours a day for six months it was a huge huge challenge and not only that I didn't actually think I could ever finish it. It was so far beyond anything I'd ever tried before. I'd literally never programmed assembly before. I've, I've programmed small games before, but it was just, you know, what's the most impossible thing you think you can aim at? And that's what I tried to do. And hopefully you think I pulled it off fairly reasonably. Well, anyway, oh, the final thing here, the, the spoof scoring system where, well, however well you do, you just get insulted. It was a little joke that I came up with. Uh, I had some spare time at the end, so I coded it. I actually had coded it in. Um, it, it was something that didn't really make any sense, and I wasn't sure it was ever going to be in there at first. Well, anyway, um, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Goodbye now.